paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. From the ancient world to the modern, history tells the story of our ever-growing need to be ever-growing. The story of how some people will go to extraordinary lengths to expand, create, to advance, to push the realm of possibility, to prove that size matters. This series will explore larger-than-life creations that have influenced every facet of our society. The way we live, work, and travel. The way we build empires. And the way we dream. We look back at the ways we've strived to make the biggest, heaviest, tallest, the best. We hear from experts about the technology that made these feats possible, the challenges that were faced, and the problems that were solved. Some of these inventions have changed the world and our way of life. Others, not so much. Whether a success or a failure, these giants have demonstrated mankind's need to build big. For as long as man has been alive, he has fought to defend what is rightfully his, and fought even harder to take what is not. And as he quickly found out, the man with the biggest weapon is always at an advantage. We look at weapons, at the fighting machines that have revolutionized warfare, at the planes, tanks, ships, submarines and guns, and at how they just keep getting bigger. With military weapons, the desire to build is meeting a requirement where it was needed. Whether they guarantee victory or just cost a lot of money, one thing's for sure, in modern warfare, it's all about battling big. We start where war has only recently been waged. In the sky, in little more than a hundred years, fighting aircraft have developed from rickety contraptions of wood, wire and canvas, to huge, hugely complex and hugely lethal machines. And if one shape symbolizes the awesome scale of modern air power, it is this one. The Boeing B-52 Stratofortress. The B-52 nicknamed Buff for Big Ugly Fat Fellow, is a long-range strategic bomber deployed by the United States Air Force. A simply amazing aeroplane, if only for the length of time it has been in service already and the length of time it will continue to be in service with the US Air Force. Astonishingly, it first flew more than half a century ago, in 1954, at the height of the Cold War. It was originally built to carry nuclear bombs, but over the decades has been improved and developed. In Vietnam, they did some modifications to it. They called it the Big Belly modification, which changed it from being intended to carry nuclear weapons to carrying a large number of conventional bombs. The B-52 has an average combat radius of 7,200 kilometers the longest range of any bomber. 
but it can actually fly a lot further, with a total range of more than 25,000 kilometers. Well over halfway round the 40,000 kilometer circumference of the world. And it's massive. Over 12 meters in height, with a wingspan of over 56 meters. The B-52 has a maximum bomb load of 27,216 kilograms. It's big, noisy. It is designed for a specific purpose and it performs that purpose very well. Nothing else looks like it. Current engineering analyses show that we can expect the iconic B-52 to remain operational beyond the year 2040 almost 90 years since it first took to the skies. It's interesting when you see enthusiasts who come across it for the first time, there is definitely an oh wow, awesome factor involved in it there because it's so important and so different. When the B-52 first appeared, it was the jet age successor to an equally feared and famous propeller driven aircraft. Even the name evolved. The Boeing B-52 Stratofortress was in direct line of descent from the plane that was, when it entered service, the largest bomber in the world. The Boeing B-29 Superfortress. It was a bit of a technical marvel. Um, able to carry quite a large bomb load over a long distance was very, very highly advanced for its time. The B-29, built from 1944, featured what was at the time cutting edge technology, including a pressurized cabin, a fire control system, and remote controlled machine gun turrets. And the quote was, they could put a bomb into a pickle barrel. It was so, supposedly so accurate. The program dwarfs anything before attempted in aviation manufacturing. The B-29 was the world's heaviest production plane. With a 9,072 kilogram bomb load, it weighed over 47,627 kilograms, 33,800 kilograms unladen compared to the British four-engine Lancaster at 27,400. But it had a top speed of 579, compared to the Lancaster's 442, and could reach an altitude of 9,708 meters. The B-29 has longer range than any other bomber in the world. Boeing built a total of 2,766 B-29s. But of course, its most important thing was the fact that it ended the war by dropping the atomic bomb. Remotely fired guns, speed, ceiling and bomb load have made the B-29 the most formidable air weapon known to man. Pilotless bombs missile systems and more sophisticated weapons have changed the look, shape and size of bombers. But one still flies that qualifies for the supersize label. The Tupolev Tu-160 is the heaviest supersonic combat aircraft ever built. I've seen it in the air once. It left an indelible impression. The main one being how loud it was. It was the loudest aeroplane I've ever heard in my life. Once the noise of it had subsided a little, we could hear the sound of about eight million car alarms going off in the car park. The Tu-160, also known as Blackjack, is the world's largest operational supersonic bomber with a wingspan of 55.7 meters, a height of 13.1 meters, and at 267,000 kilograms laden, it weighs two and a half times as much as the largest animal ever to have lived, the blue whale. The prototype flew in 1981, and the 160 became operational in 1987. 
production continuing until 1992, when President Yeltsin announced that no further strategic bombers would be built. It is believed that production totaled no more than 39 blackjacks. It was very, very powerful, swing wings. The blackjack is armed with cruise and attack missiles, both of which are capable of carrying nuclear warheads and can also carry freefall bombs. In 1989, a Tu-160 reached a speed of 2,200 kilometers for the first time. And in its lifetime, the blackjack has set 44 world records. And it was quite an animal. And there is talk about putting it back into production again. Weapons development has seen a reduction in the size of bombers and a decline in the role of piloted aircraft. But in one area of military aviation, size will always matter. Because the military will always need a rapid lift and deploy capability for troops and their equipment. And the AN-124 can carry a lot of equipment. Developed in 1979, it has been continually updated over the years. The Antonov 124 Condor was the biggest aircraft in the world. But it is still the largest military transport and the second heaviest operating cargo aircraft. 36.5 meters long, 6.4 meters wide, and 4.3 meters high, the AN-124 has a cargo lift capacity of 150 tons. The original intention was to build something that could carry things like Soviet battle tanks. The AN-124 aircraft is fitted with a relatively thick swept back supercritical wing to give it the capacity to travel 4,500 kilometers at a height of up to 10,000 meters. One of the times I saw one was quite exciting. Can you imagine an aeroplane that large being taken to beyond the vertical in, in a bank angle? And it just is not natural for an aeroplane that big to be thrown around the sky the way it was. Earlier in the history of aviation, aircraft like the Antonov were not possible. And not just because of the technology required to build and power them. Aircraft development outpaced the global development of airports. Which is why there was a time when the preferred form for supersized flying machines was the flying boat. There was no limit on the length of water runways. And the largest flying boat to enter production was the Martin JRM Mars. The Glenn L. Martin Company, founded in 1912, produced the largest Allied flying boat of the Second World War when it introduced their JRM Mars model. The JRM Mars was commissioned by the United States Navy for use as an overwater patrol bomber. The developmental XPB-2M-2 Mars's first flight was on June 23, 1942 and the aircraft was formally adopted by the United States Navy on November 30th, 1943. The Mars series aircraft had a length of 36 meters, twice the length of a bowling lane, a wingspan of 61 meters, and a height of 12 meters. It was designed to carry about 130 troops and something like uh, 30 tons of cargo or seven light vehicles. The 25-ton seaplane sails smoothly and proudly over the bay, the biggest plane ever built in the United States. But in the end, the Pacific was a naval war, and the Mars had a limited combat role. Only seven of these giant flying boats were built. It continued in its role in the United States Navy until 1956. It later on became best known as a, a fire bomber. 
Light seaplanes continue to link islands around the world. But with the Mars, the age of the large flying boat came to an end. The sea returned to being the sole domain of fighting ships. And there, more than anywhere else, the race to be the most potent weapon has been won with the race to be the biggest. That race, the naval arms race, helped destabilize international relations through the first half of the 20th century when it was all about battleships. But those battleships were made obsolete by the biggest and most lethal ships of all, the aircraft carrier. At the end of World War II, aircraft carriers grew in size enormously, driven by two things. One of them was the jet aircraft. And the other was the development of the atomic bomb. The most powerful belonged to the American Navy, and the most potent of these are the Nimitz class. The 10 Nimitz class carriers have up to 18 levels, including eight above the hangar bay and 10 below. Well, they're very big. They're uh, nearly a kilometer long and they displace a full load, something like 100,000 tons three and a half times the weight of the Statue of Liberty. The power to push these mighty ships through the water comes from two nuclear reactors. The 10 Nimitz-class aircraft carriers are each designed for a 50-year service life, with one midlife refueling. Performance figures are classified, but it can achieve in excess of 30 knots and its range is quoted in time, not distance. It can operate non-stop for between 20 and 25 years. Their replacements will be the Gerald R. Ford class, which boast more advanced technologies, but in terms of size, match the Nimitz, being built substantially on the same hull. The second of the Ford class has begun. She'll be named John F. Kennedy. And these are even mightier ships than the Nimitz class. The largest Western European warship and the only nuclear-powered carrier to be commissioned outside the United States is the French Charles de Gaulle class, launched in May 1994 and commissioned in September 2000. Weighing 38,000 tons and with a 195-metre runway, the ship cannot match the Nimitz class for sheer presence, but it packs a considerable punch. The nuclear power gives the ship an ability to steam for some years without refuelling. The Charles de Gaulle carries a fleet of up to 40 aircraft the Raphael M Super Etendard combat planes and three E-2C Hawkeye airborne early warning aircraft. But they found that the flight deck was too short for the Hawkeye aircraft, so the flight deck was actually extended by another three metres. It also carries AS-565 Panther or NH-90 helicopters and has the capacity to track up to 2,000 targets. The ship is also engineered with eight Nexter 20F2 20mm guns, firing shells at 720 rounds per minute, up to eight kilometres. The costs associated with actually building the ship and also some of the, the fiscal constraints that France was experiencing meant that only one was actually constructed. Aircraft carriers project lethal power but in combat situations, armed forces still face situations where they need to close with and engage the enemy. For such operations where troops need to transfer from ship to shore, amphibious vessels have a vital role. So 
So the wasp pass are 40,000 tonnes, uh, nearly 260 metres in length. So the capacity is 1,200 troops. They can also have an air wing of about 25 aircraft and their crew is about 1,300. Superficially resembling aircraft carriers, these modern amphibious assault vessels carry everything needed to conduct landing operations on board. Troops, amphibious assault craft, transport helicopters, and fixed and rotary winged aircraft. It also has quite elaborate command control facilities uh, on board the ship. Which makes the amphibious assault ship the primary warship in an assault ready group, ARG a fleet specifically dedicated to coastal operations. ARGs can launch an amphibious operation and remain for extended periods of time in support of the landing. The WASP class are 25% bigger than any other amphibious ship in the world. Another part of the story is told below the waves, where vessels with astonishing intercontinental firepower, in the words of those who sail in them, run silent, run deep. When the world's first nuclear-powered submarine, the USS Nautilus, came into service in 1954, it made possible the sort of endurance that makes the submarine lethal. She was the submarine which really opened many people's eyes to the advantage of nuclear power. Thanks to its nuclear reactor, the Nautilus could stay submerged at sea for extremely long periods. She's capable of a complete round-the-world voyage underwater. In its maiden voyage, the Nautilus travelled underwater for 2,558 kilometres from New London, Connecticut, to San Juan, Puerto Rico, giving it the record at the time for the longest submerged cruise and the highest sustained speed ever recorded. Nautilus did many interesting things like going under the Arctic ice and proving that nuclear submarines could operate under the Arctic. Three percent of the trip was made submerged, and it's reported that she can travel at over 20 knots underwater. The potential was seen for making the submarine not simply an anti-ship weapon, but a weapons platform. Earlier generations of nuclear submarines required refueling during their lifetime at periodic intervals. Uh, today, nuclear submarines are being built with nuclear reactors which are fueled once. And if we measure submarines by their punching power, the title supersize belongs to the American-built Ohio class. The Ohio class, the US Navy's ballistic missile submarines, carry more firepower than any other submarine. These, in terms of the threat posed, are the monsters of the deep. The 19,000 tonne Ohio class submarines are about 170 meters long. These vessels display 16,600 tons when surfaced and 18,750 tons when submerged more than one and a half times the length of a football field at 170 meters and with a top speed classified but rated at more than 20 knots the ohio vessels carry in addition to 24 trident nuclear missiles per boat mk-48 torpedoes and in some variants tomahawk cruise missiles Remaining undetected is an enormous challenge for any submarine. Uh, you need to remain as quiet as you possibly can. 
Regarded as the quietest submarine in the world, the hulls of the Ohio are covered with anechoic tiles that eliminate detection by sonar. And the endurance of a nuclear-powered submarine is really determined by how much food you can carry for the crew and how long you can lock 120 or so people up inside a long metal tube. The increasing sophistication of and size and power of the weapons used in the air and at sea decisively influence the balance of power. But for most of the conflicts in most of the world's trouble spots, it continues to be the weapons that do battle on land that decide outcomes. And one class of weapon literally joins the land and the sea in a continuous offensive operation. The landing craft air cushion, LCAC, is a high-speed, fully amphibious landing craft that literally beaches itself. LCAC is one of the largest of the landing craft that are currently in use. Capable of carrying a 60 to 75 ton payload and able to be launched from WASP and Tarawa class vessels, LCACs are used to transport weapon systems, equipment, cargo and personnel from ship onto the shore and if required, across the beach. Because it's a cushion craft with big jet fans on it, it's able to move very fast, up to around 40 knots, and get to the shore as quickly as possible with the largest load of troops as possible so that you can build up your force ashore at a very rapid rate. Only about 15% of the world's coastline is accessible by conventional landing craft. LCACs, however, can reach 70 percent. It's about 190 tons in weight and about 80 feet by about 40 feet. A total of 91 LCACs have been built. And they are also capable of moving one of these. The US Army's operational tank unit, the 1st Armored Regiment, is equipped with the main battle tank, the M1 Abrams. It's awesome. Um, it was originally designed to take on uh, the Soviet main battle tanks. The Abrams is a giant with a weight of 62,000 kilograms, approximately the same as 40 family cars. It's a very powerful, now very fast, well-protected tank with a stabilized turret and uh, computer-guided rounds so it can you know, move, shoot at the same time. And its computer guidance is so good that essentially if you can see a target, it's, you know, it's going to hit the target. The 120 millimeter main gun on the M1A1 and M1A2 combined with a 1,500 horsepower turbine engine and special armor, make it the weapon of choice for attacking or defending against large concentrations of heavy armor on a highly lethal battlefield. So it's uh, really the state of the art of modern tanks. The Abrams, the ultimate fighting vehicle on land today, is the present state-of-the-art in tank development that continued through much of the 20th century. Its equivalent, when America faced German armor in the Second World War, was the M4 Sherman, the primary tank of the US Army and Marine Corps in World War II.
It wasn't originally designed to take on another tank, but it had uh, more of a cavalry design intent behind it. It was designed for speed and maneuverability, as opposed to armor and firepower. The design never imagined the Sherman fighting other tanks. That was left to anti-tank guns and tank destroyers. Shermans were designed to tear through the enemy to make room for infantry. But when the US you know, entered Second World War and the Sherman saw it as sea action, its ability to fight German tanks was uh, revealed as being inadequate. And so over the course of the war, they had to upgun it, creating jumbo versions of the original Sherman. But the Sherman came into its own in mass attack tactics. And thanks to American industry, mass is the way the Sherman was supersized. First operational in 1942, in only three years, 48,000 had entered service. If you were a tank crew and your Sherman got hit and it was disabled, you could just get out, you know, walk to where the tank depot was, where there'd be you know, hundreds of spare tanks, just hop in another one and you know, drive back out. Modern warfare invariably operates on a much smaller scale against guerrilla-style non-state forces. Such irregular forms of conflict has seen weapons development forced to move away from the traditional and devise the unorthodox. MRAP, mine-resistant ambush protective vehicles, are an outstanding example. When the enemy started to come up with uh, improvised explosive devices, IEDs, the current design of vehicles for transporting people were very thinly armed, and so were highly vulnerable to an explosive charge you know, under a road. So that's how this class evolved. And typically they have increased armor, but the most important design is they come with a V-shaped hull underneath, so that if anything detonates underneath, the explosive charge is directed outwards. Unlike previous vehicles, which had flat bottoms, and so that allowed the blast charge to go carry into the vehicle. There are three categories of MRAP. Vehicles weighing about seven tons and capable of carrying six passengers. Vehicles weighing about 19 tons and capable of carrying 10 passengers and vehicles intending to be used primarily to clear mines and IEDs, weighing about 22.5 tons and capable of carrying up to 12 passengers. If a five-liter water jug filled with explosives was to go off, you know, a Humvee, uh, which is a lightly armed vehicle, would be, you know, would disintegrate. But uh, MRAP, the soldiers would be alive. These vehicles have been in use by the U.S. Army and U.S. Marine Corps for over a decade. As smaller scale military operations against smaller, less technically advanced enemies become more common, the trend to use smaller, multi-capacity, self-contained forces with the ability to deploy anywhere in the world at short notice has accelerated. Their deployment has in turn meant the identification of weapons requirements not met from the traditional armory. A rapid response force that could rapidly deploy and effectively operate in all types of military operations required tailor-made transport. Enter the Striker. Lighter than a tank, with more firepower than a Humvee or an MRAP, the Striker is a family of eight-wheel drive combat vehicles, first built for the US Army in 2003. It is lighter, smaller, 
and more readily deployable than any other Army combat vehicle. And the United States fielded these vehicles with the intention to be able to project power rapidly where it was needed. The vehicle weighs approximately 19 tons and can reach speeds of 100 kilometers per hour. Stryker's armor provides integral all-round 14.5 millimeter protection against machine gun rounds, mortar, and artillery fragments. In Iraq, in January 2004, Stryker vehicles were outfitted with a cage of armor as protection against rocket-propelled grenades. It's armed with 120 millimeter cannons, which can engage other armored vehicles to anti-personnel weapons, 50 caliber machine guns, 40 millimeter grenade launches. The Striker combines speed and devastating weaponry with the ability to transport people to remote locations. So you can fly an Abrams tank, but it basically maxes out a heavy transport aircraft but instead you put several strikers in the same cargo hold. Aircraft, ships, and land combat are all critical components of warfare. But there is one aspect of war that has always existed and evolved. It is what makes the warship, the warplane, and the soldier on the ground into a lethal force. It's the weapons. Nuclear bombs, including atomic, hydrogen, and neutron, get their explosive force through nuclear reactions that occur when atoms are rapidly split apart, fission, or when atomic nuclei are forcibly joined to form a heavier nucleus, fusion. International treaties have identified atomic bombs as weapons of mass destruction. The first nuclear test occurred on July 16, 1945, near Alamogordo, New Mexico. No one knew what would happen. People a hundred miles away say it looked like the sun rising suddenly at night. It was the first man-made explosion of atomic energy. It was produced by the Manhattan Project, now about $20 billion budget, and it was specifically designed to uh, destroy uh, cities, so all the infrastructure and the living inhabitants. Oppenheimer expressed his feelings in part by quoting a verse from the Hindu scripture. Now I am become death, he said, the destroyer of worlds. The atomic bomb has been used twice, both times against Japan. The first bomb, named Little Boy, was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. The B-29 dropped its load of atomic death, which exploded with a force equal to 20,000 tons of TNT. Only approximately 1.38% of the highly enriched uranium fuel actually fissioned. When the Japanese government did not respond, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki on August 9. Fat Man, an implosion-type bomb with just over six kilograms of plutonium fuel, approximately the size of a football, was 10 times more efficient than the little boy. It produced an enormous fireball and an enormous shockwave. So you have one to two kilometers of all living things, all infrastructure completely flattened. All of you who see this picture can judge for yourselves the extent of the menace to civilization of this new weapon. The Japanese government capitulated shortly afterwards, and the Second World War was over. 
Nuclear bombs were symbolic of a kind of heliocentrism, which was to capture the idea that you could control the energy of the sun. Weapons development has looked at the tremendous power of nuclear energy and not restricted it to devastating bombs. The development of tactical nuclear weapons, sometimes called mini-nukes, predominantly occurred at the height of the Cold War. The first nuclear artillery shell developed by the United States was fired on May 25, 1953 at the Nevada test site out of an M65 cannon nicknamed Atomic Annie. Now, when we say a small nuclear bomb, we have to understand that you know, we're looking at something that still had considerably more destructive power than the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It produced a yield estimated at 15 kilotons. Atomic Annie was an early Cold War improvisation using one of the oldest weapons, an artillery piece, to deliver the newest, a nuclear device. The big gun provides more accurate and damaging support to ground troops than any other gun in the recorded history of warfare. If you were to use it against advancing Soviet division of you know, 15, 20,000 soldiers, you would annihilate that formation and leave a radioactive wasteland behind it. The design was suggested by railway guns that had featured in both world wars. The length of 26 meters was nearly all barrel, and the range was 30 kilometers. The Kenworth Motor Truck Company designed and built special tractor trucks to move the M65, a puller and a pusher. The cannon weighs 42 and a half thousand kilograms, and the complete rig on the trucks more than 78,000, which is more than the space shuttle. 20 M65s were deployed in Europe and Korea. Unfortunately, it was never used. It was tested and it works, but as we all know, the Cold War never turned hot and so their time had passed. No matter how potent weapons become, the individual in the helmet carrying their weapon will always be the foundation of a nation's armed services. And here too, weapons designers have labored to build bigger and better. Amongst handheld weapons today, that probably means the Barrett anti-material rifle. The Barrett in the range designated M82 M107 was first designated an anti-material weapon. They're called anti-material weapons because their function is to, let's say, penetrate or hit the engine block of a vehicle and wreck the engine block. And in many armed forces, it can be found in use as a long-range sniper weapon. It fires a very hard slug or 50 caliber round, which is a, essentially the largest bullet that's available. The Barrett has an effective range, depending on variant, of up to seven kilometers. Depending on the model, it weighs in at around 14 kilograms, substantially more than the standard British Lee Enfield of the First and much of the Second World War. But then, the Barrett does substantially more, which is why versions of it are in service with the armed forces of more than 50 countries. So this weapon gives a soldier the ability to fire at a long distance a round that could bring a vehicle to a halt. But targets are not always small. They are not always close at hand. Most of all, 
they are not always slow moving or static. Weapons designers found the answer to building something bigger that could shoot something large, further away, and perhaps closing fast in a very different sort of gun. The GAU-8, known as the Avenger, is a gun of a very different type. The Avenger is a tank killer. And it could take out an entire column of vehicles. It is huge and extremely lethal. Six meters long and weighing a hefty 280 kilograms plus. This Gatling gun type weapon is clearly not meant to be carried by hand into battle. It was designed to be mounted on the A-10 close air support jet fighter and is one of the most powerful aircraft cannons ever built. Aircraft can be quite delicate and you don't want them to be knocked out of the sky by the weapon that it's firing. And when a projectile goes that way, there's an equal force going that way. And so the A-10 has to be specifically designed to withstand that force. It fires large, depleted uranium, armor-piercing shells. And it can kill anything from battlefield tanks to other aircraft. Its potency owes everything to the combination of quantity and accuracy. The GAU-8 fires 30 mm caliber ammunition at a dizzying 4,200 rounds per minute over a three and a half kilometer range and at a muzzle velocity well in excess of three and a half thousand kilometers an hour. Combine this with pinpoint accuracy and you have an incredibly devastating weapon. So if you're on the ground receiving this fire, it is one of the most terrifying weapons that you could be attacked by uh, because it will almost act like a street sweeper and clean up anything that's exposed. Weapons that have a lethal capability on the battlefield, like the GAU, seem insignificant compared to those that can travel halfway across the world to deliver complete destruction. If nuclear weapons offer ultimate devastation, the capacity to detonate them a continent away is the ultimate threat. It is the threat of the intercontinental ballistic missile. First deployed by the United States and the Soviet Union in 1959, ICBMs are capable of delivering large nuclear warheads, 1,000 kiloton or more, at supersonic speeds, striking targets at over 10,000 kilometers away in about 30 minutes from launch. The ICBM is the most advanced, intricate, and complicated weapon system ever devised. ICBMs can be launched from stationary or mobile platforms on land, from aircraft, surface ships, and from submarines. First deployed in September 1959, the Atlas SM-65 was the United States' first operational intercontinental ballistic missile. We had a complementary weapon to be used against any target which we could foresee in potentially hostile nations, no matter how far distant. So all the major populations in the Soviet Union could have been targeted by it. The Atlas was approximately 26 meters high and weighed 118 tons. At liftoff, the rocket developed 1,300 kilonewtons of thrust and carried a warhead that packed 100 times the destructive power of Fat Man, the Nagasaki bomb. 
The explosive force of just one of these weapons in TNT equivalents was roughly even more than the entire explosive um, devices used in the Second World War. At the height of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union had so many ICBMs in their arsenal that the two nations had reached what was called the mad level, mutually assured destruction. So the old saying that we had more than enough to destroy the planet several times over is quite true. In the relentless effort to be more powerful, faster, harder hitting, bigger than the weapons you face, a weapons race has been part of the human condition since man first picked up a club. There's a fascination to make a statement um, by having something that's large. And size is a measure of the use of that product. And the giants of the air, sea and land, have meant the difference between victory and defeat. As life continues, who can doubt that we will create bigger, faster, better ways to fight? Supersized weaponry that can bring peace or destroy it. <laughs>